Okay, so let me do this question. This is a question I've wanted to do for a while. Um, I think you have a homework question um, in your homework set that somewhat relates to it, to it. And I think I've done that question in one particular way. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this question for a while is um, to cover this in all the ways. Uh, the wording of this question suggests that there are these two different ways to approach this question. And I will actually tell you that there's a third way to approach the question. So let me just do this one problem in all those three different ways and um, kind of show the consistency between different methods. So the, the first question, part A, says use conservation of energy to find the speeds of the disk and the ring at the bottom of the inclined plane. Okay, let's do that. So, um, so I'm dealing with uh, four different snapshots. I'm dealing with, um, let me call this A, snapshot A for, you know, at the top of the thing, for the ring, for the disk. And even though they are shown separated, let's say they are starting at the same height. So ring and the disk are starting at some height H, and that's my snapshot A, um, my initial snapshot. And my snapshot uh, B uh, for the ring and for the disk, which actually occurs at different times, but the timing of it actually doesn't matter anyway, is once at the bottom. So the disk is moving at some speed. Let me call that V disk. And the ring is moving at some speed. Let me call that V ring. And this snapshot, we'll call this B, is the second set of snapshots that I'll consider. And two snapshots for each set, um, two, uh, each set, two sets. So that's a total of four snapshots that we should be considering to use conservation of energy. So, um, so let me first uh, uh, apply this method for the disk, and then I will change anything that needs to change for the ring, and then um, we'll go from there. You know, which object should and the goal and the goal is to answer this question: which object should arrive at bottom quicker, and by how much? And I will give you some uh, kinematics trick to do this calculation uh, relatively quickly. So, um, for A, I'm using conservation of energy. And hopefully, as you are looking at this situation, you have a sense that the energy is conserved. Um, even though there is a friction, it's a static friction, it's not doing any work. The, or if it's doing work, the work that's being done is actually transforming uh, gravitational potential energy into rotational kinetic energy, or what would have gone into translational kinetic energy into rotational kinetic energy. So as long as you make sure to account to all the forms of energy, that is the, the potential energy plus the translational kinetic energy plus the rotational kinetic energy, then it's going to be conserved, by which we mean that these quantities taken at snapshot A is going to be equal to these same quantities, you know, same expressions, potential energy, translational kinetic energy, plus rotational kinetic energy, um, taken, uh, calculated at snapshot B, the total sum should be the same. So let's uh, write them out. We have, um, so expression for gravitational potential energy, that's uh, going to be, so I, let me make sure I, uh, it's, I'm gonna be doing it for disk first. So gravitational potential energy, MGH, plus the translational kinetic energy, one half M. And at the top, so let me write down VA squared, and then as I'm writing it down, I'm realizing, oh, that's going to be zero. So, all right, it's going to be zero. Plus the rotational kinetic energy, one half rotational inertia over disk times its, uh, not speed, angular speed uh, in snapshot A squared. And what, uh, once again, I'm realizing when it's starting out from rest, it's also not rotating, so this will be zero. 
So all of this should equal the final kinetic energy, final uh, potential energy, where, so, you know, by specifying this as H, I have implicitly uh, defined this point, you know, bottom position as Y equals zero. So my gravitational potential energy at that point will be zero. Plus, okay, now I actually need um, translational kinetic energy, one half M times the symbol for speed I'll be using, Vd squared plus one half rotational inertia times angular speed um, squared. So let me uh, write down the simplified version, uh, mgh is equal to one half mvd squared plus one half i omega d squared. And let me do some um, in place uh, simplifications. So I wrote um, I, uh, I, D, for rotational inertia of a disk. And I know what the rotational inertia of a disk is in terms of known parameters. So let's plug that in. Uh, I'm going to put in, uh, let me just move this out a little bit and replace I, D with the expression for the rotational inertia. So that's going to be... one half mass times the radius of the disk squared. Okay, that's one. And I need an expression for my angular speed. Otherwise, this is one equation, two unknowns, you know, Vd and omega d, I can't really solve for it. And whenever you have things that are rolling, and um, guess it, it didn't quite explicitly say so, but, um, it's reasonable to assume that things are rolling without sleeping. Whenever you have that happening, you have this condition. The translational speed of the center of mass of a circular object is equal to the radius of the circular object times its angular velocity. I, I've gone through this discussion elsewhere, did the derivation, so I'm just gonna use this or the version of it that's a solve for omega is equal to V center of mass divided by R. I'm just going to use that here. So I'll replace omega d squared with um, the speed of Vd. V, what I've labeled as Vd is the velocity of center of mass divided by radius of the, the disk squared. So once you've written this out, you see a bit of a beautiful simplification. You have r squared here, and you are going to have r squared and vd squared here when you distribute the exponent. So r squared actually cancels out. So whatever the radius of the disk is, doesn't matter, doesn't actually factor in. And uh, finishing out this simplification, let me just scroll down a little bit. What you have is, um, it looks like I can actually factor out 1 half mvd squared. It's in every single term. So let me factor out 1 half mvd squared. So I have 1 from my translational term, plus the terms from here, I factored out 1 half mvd squared. I have 1 half remaining, 1 half. So what that rotational kinetic energy does is it takes this term that would have been 1 without rolling, and it changes it to, you know, 1.5. So it makes the cost of kinetic energy higher because um, when it's rolling in addition to moving translationally, then there's more kinetic energy involved in that uh, same motion or motion of the same speed. So let me solve it for Vd. I think that's gonna help me answer uh, that question, which object should to arrive at the bottom quicker and by how much. Let me solve this for Vd. Vd is equal to, in the interest of time, I'm just gonna do the algebra in my head. <laughs> if necessary, or let me just do a little bit more so that I don't confuse myself. This is 3 halves, so it's going to be 3 fourths uh, 3d squared after having cancelled out m. So the rest of the algebra I'm going to do in my head, um, uh, if necessary. Pause the video and make sure you, your answer agrees to the mine. So it's going to be um, 4gh divided by 3 square rooted. 
I could pull out some quantities outside the square root, but I didn't feel that that actually simplifies anything. So let me leave that here. So that's the answer for final speed at the bottom of the uh, slope for the, for the disk. Uh, when you think of doing the same calculation for the ring, uh, I hope you will realize that um, a lot of this doesn't need to change. So you can basically take this, use that as a starting point, and as you are dealing with, uh, let me just uh, take a couple things so that I don't have to keep scrolling up and down. So as you are doing this the same calculation, this time for uh, for the for the ring, where rotational inertia of a ring is m r squared, you can go through each line of calculation and think through what needs to change. So where it had rotational inertia of a disk before, that now needs to change into ring, which means uh, when I plug in the rotational inertia here, this shouldn't be one half anymore. It should be just one. And the rest of it actually doesn't change other than changing the symbol to ring, ring, not disk. So when you arrive at this point in the calculation, this just turns into one, not one half, which means this 1.5 that I wrote. So, you know, the this time the cost of rolling and moving the ring is now even higher. It's, uh, uh, it's you know, higher by a factor of two instead of 1.5 as before. So the quantity here is no longer 3 fourth, it's just a 1 uh, times VD squared after canceling out mass. So when you solve for VD, I can get rid of this, or sorry, not VD. Uh, let me make sure I'm using correct symbol, VR for the ring, VR for the ring. So VR for the ring, it's just going to be square root of G times H. So let me just move this in. and square root of gh. So compare these two answers. All right, so you are looking at these two comparing what we calculated before for disk versus what we are calculating now for ring. Uh, you can kind of compare them. They both have square root of gh. Uh, so this has square root of 4 thirds, where this has square root of 1. So this is greater, um, meaning the disk has higher speed at the end of the rolling down, uh, so we would expect to it to arrive at the bottom more quickly. So as you are thinking through this, that you are comparing two objects, both of them start at speed uh, zero at the top, and at the bottom, they have two different final speeds. Um, if the question had asked uh, which one has higher final speed and what is it, then, then we'll be done. Unfortunately, what the question asks is this. Which object, uh, let me just copy and paste that in. Which object should arrive at the bottom quicker and by how much? So what the question is asking for, it's not asking for anything about speeds directly. It's actually asking for what is the difference in time. So we need to calculate that. I think some of the geometry quantities are easier to get. So they gave us h and they gave us theta, which means we can actually figure out the distance. This distance, uh, let me call that delta x. That should be uh, h divided by sine theta. If you are not sure, you know, go through the uh, geometry yourself and make sure that this is correct. I'm pretty sure that is correct. <laughs> so, um, so okay, geometry factors are easy enough. And um, I think the method a lot of people will take is that, okay, I know the final velocity. I can figure out the displacement. Now let's go through the kinematics equations. And one of the kinematics equations you'll come across is the one that says delta x is equal to 1 half a t squared plus v naught t plus, uh, well, that is delta x. Um, so that, and you can combine that with, um, 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 you can combine that with a, a number of other equations, either, you know, delta v is, uh, acceleration times time, or even v final squared is equal to 
for initial squared plus 2 times a times delta x. And what I will tell you is that all these uh, methods are the long way. They can, there's a way to do this calculation a lot uh, more quickly uh, with a fewer steps in between. And it will follow from uh, having a good understanding of definitions and kind of staring at and realizing what quantities that you actually need. What you're actually being asked for is delta t. What you actually have is the initial and final speed, different from knowing the difference in velocity. Um, and uh, you have the displacement. And if you are looking to connect this most directly, or, or for example, if you are looking to find an expression that relates to this most directly, it's actually a quantity that's not any of the things on the screen. It's the average speed. Average speed is related to the displacement divided by the duration of time. And you might think, oh, but I don't have average speed. How does uh, writing this down help me? Well, writing this down helps you because in a situation like this, constant acceleration, there is a special formula for average speed. So in the situation of constant acceleration, one of the formulas we have covered in lecture is the average speed that can be calculated from initial and the final speeds. It's the initial speed plus, not difference, final speed divided by 2. You can figure this out geometrically, a bunch of different ways to figure out. But what it comes down to is this is a simple formula for average speed that relates a quantity you know with the quantities that you are trying to find. So you can equate these two different expressions for average speed and say delta x over delta t is equal to v initial, which is zero in our case, plus v final, which we worked out. It's either speed of the disk or the ring divided by two. So I can solve this expression for delta t pretty quickly. Just doing that algebra in my head, delta t is equal to two times h divided by sine theta divided by that v. So v that we calculate, it's uh, so. Applying this formula, it's uh, either going to be um, so. It's either going to be um, so the duration of time for the for the disk would be um, two h over sine theta. This is all the common factors times. Now I have the expression for reciprocal of v of d uh, comes from uh, comes from there. It will be square root of 3 over 4 gh for the disk. Or applying that with the ring would be duration of time for ring is 2h over sine theta times a reciprocal of that, which would be square root of 1 over gh. So from here, if you have numerical parameters, you can get the duration of time in this single calculation and get the difference in time. Or, you know, if you want to finish up algebraically, the difference of the difference of time would be, uh, I can factor out a lot of this. I can factor out 2h over sine theta and even 1 over square root of gh, which I can actually simplify a little further, but I'll just leave that as it is. Um, square root of 3 fourth, wait, not do it. Let me do larger minus uh, smaller. So it will be 1 minus smaller, 3 over 4. So this is uh, one way of doing this calculation for that one question. Uh, part B of the question Hint uh, gives you a way to do this calculation in a different way. So let's do part B. So, um, so uh, the way I'm going to approach this part B is actually similar to the method I used in that other question, uh, or in in the uh, in one of your homework questions. So uh, in part B, it asks you to use a standard strategy to find the accelerations of the disk and the ring 
And then it asks the, basically the same question, you know, how does this relate to which object arrives at the bottom faster? Okay, so let's uh, find the acceleration. Um, so you start with the free body diagram, and I have a sense, um, as far as my free body diagram goes, the free body diagram of the disk or ring won't be different all that much. So let me just draw one diagram and I'll use it for both. So I have an object of some mass m. Oh, and I have to be careful. So now that we are doing rigid body rotation, I can't use a dot for object anymore because I'm going to be going to be calculating torque. So I do need to have an indication of where the force is acting so that where necessary, I can calculate, I can find the lever arm. So on this object, in the center is where gravity is acting. So let me say mg, that's one force. And um, I have a point of contact, I think somewhere here. That's the place where normal force is acting. So let me draw normal force there. N, and I've drawn it correctly. When it's correctly drawn, it should go from point of contact through the center of mass. That's how it should appear for normal force. And if this is where you end the drawing free body diagram, that's actually incorrect. Uh, you can see that it's incorrect because if, uh, if you try to use your center of mass as your center of rotation, um, um, it won't work. Neither of these two forces are exerting any torque. But somehow, magically, if you choose this point as your center of rotation, then it works. Gravity is giving you torque. That inconsistency should tell you that uh, something is wrong. <laughs> and what's wrong is that uh, you will have forgotten friction. You need to include the friction that's working here. And, you know, at the start of the semester, we said we try to ignore friction whenever we can. And this is the example of a situation where we can't ignore friction because ignoring friction leads to uh, contradictions. So, okay, that's uh, all my forces and I'm pretty convinced that I've drawn all the forces. <laughs> um, um, so, center strategy, step number one, draw free body diagram. Step number two, we need to define axis. So, okay, the acceleration is in this direction. So the way we should define axis goes x this way, y that way. So my normal force is along y, my friction force is along negative x. Oh, so I should break down my gravity into uh, y and x component. And um, I have gone through this rodeo <laughs> enough to know that this is my angle theta, same as this angle theta here. Um, uh, hopefully you have enough practice by now that when I say that it doesn't sound surprising. So breaking down forces into components. So this is my y component. So this should be mg cosine theta. It's the adjacent side to the angle. This uh, x component should be mg sine theta. That's my standard strategy, step number three. And having done that for step number four, I write down Newton's second law equation. And so far, I haven't had to distinguish between the ring and the disk. And in fact, uh, even with the ring, like even though there's nothing at the center of mass, you still, for the calculational purposes, you act as the, the force of gravity acts at the center of mass, you know, the place where there's nothing. <laughs> but uh, calculationally, that's how you should do it, that still works. So I'm gonna do step number four, write uh, Newton's second law equations, acceleration, is equal to net force divided by mass. And when you are dealing with uh, rigid body motion, including rotation, there's a second part to Newton's second law equations. You have angular acceleration, which would is actually a vector quantity, is equal to net torque divided by rotational inertia. So, um, so there's potentially a lot more equations. So before we did the rigid body rotation, it would have been two equations, one for x component and one for y component. And now that we are including rotation, it's now a minimum of three equations, at least one equation to make sure that uh, rotation is uh, taken into account. And if we're doing whole three-dimensional thing, you know, this is a vector, you can write it in a complicated way. But for this semester, we won't. 
So let's write this out. I have acceleration in the x direction, which is actually the acceleration of center of mass. That's going to be equal to net force. Um, so mg sine theta minus the friction force uh, divided by mass. Oops. Uh, I'm, yeah, I, I'll just use lowercase m. I just realized I've been inconsistent, but it's fine. I don't have another mess to confuse me with. Um, so for the acceleration in the y direction, we define our axis so that it's zero. Um, and the um, my y component forces are normal force minus mg cosine theta. Um, and uh, the whole thing divided by m, that's equal to zero. And I write down my rotation equations. I say my angular acceleration is equal to net torque. This is where um, I, oh, I actually forgot a step. So as you are defining your coordinate axis, um, you should you should define your center of rotation. And when you are defining your center of rotation, um, you will have up to two choices. One choice that you can use every single time is your center of mass. You can always use your uh, center of mass as your center of rotation. That's always a lot. Another second place that sometimes you can use is if your setup has a fixed point, then you can use that fixed point, you know, the actual physical center of rotation as your center of rotation. And here, this is actually a fixed point. Whenever there's a rolling motion without slipping, the point of contact is actually not moving. So you can choose this as the center of rotation. Now, I think a lot of you, um, you will actually choose that and that actually simplifies some of the considerations. So let me choose the harder point and, <laughs> and use this as my center of rotation and see if uh, we can still get a result that's uh, consistent with what you would have guessed. Um, so, uh, so with that, uh, I need to write down net torque. Let me call clockwise to be positive. So, um, so what I'm doing for each net torque calculation, I'm doing lever arm times the uh, force. Lever by lever arm, I mean the perpendicular distance from the center of rotation to the point where the force is acting. So with the normal force, level arm is zero because the line of action for normal force is going through that point. So normal force provides zero torque. Gravity is providing zero torque because distance is zero. So level arm is still zero. The only force with any kind of level arm is the friction force with this distance being the level arm. So I'll say, oh, that's the radius. Radius times the force, friction force. That's my torque divided by rotation inertia r. Ah. So this is the place where there will be a difference between a disk and a ring. So it's so okay, I, I'm at the end of my standard strategy. Let me do the thing that I tell you to do every single time. So you counter equations. I have one, two, three equations. Let's count our unknowns and see if this is solvable. So we have acceleration that I don't know, one. We have friction that I don't know, two. And we have normal force that I don't know, three. <laughs> um, and we have angular acceleration that I don't know, four. Four unknowns, three equations, that's not enough. I can't solve it. Now, a lot of you might be tempted into introducing F is equal to mu n, that actually adds more problem. One, you don't know mu. And two, even if you knew mu, this is a static friction, so it actually doesn't help. <laughs> um, the, here, the, um, the equation that you need to introduce is actually the one we used up above in using the other approach. So let me go get it. Uh, it's uh, this rolling without slipping condition. That is uh, what will give you your... Um, your third and your fourth and final equation so that you can actually solve this in terms of um, in, in, in terms of things you have. And uh, let me start out with this and I will need to modify it because when we wrote this, we had our quantities in terms of velocities. And what I can tell you is um, as just as this condition holds, 
Similar relationship holds for all other kinematics parameters. You could say uh, displacement is equal to uh, r times angular displacement, or you could say the the angular acce acceleration. So let me write it that you can say acceleration is equal to r times angular acceleration, and this is my fourth equation. So. Four equations, four unknowns. You know, this didn't introduce any new unknowns. So now we can, I, I can solve for it. And as I solve, I'm just gonna ignore this equation because all this does is it's introducing n on unknown, and it's giving me an equation. So I can solve for n using this equation, but I don't really want to know n anyway. I'm going to assume that friction coefficient is big enough that we we are never at that risk of slipping. So let me use uh, this equation four to simplify my equation three. And let me write down that simplify the version of the equation to have a system of two equations. So I have acceleration as of the center of mass is equal to, uh, let me just call that A. Um, whenever I say A, I mean, I mean acceleration of center of mass. Uh, mg sine theta minus F. And let me actually multiply through by M so that I have and A is equal to all that. And equation three, as I'm writing it down, let me replace alpha with uh, um, what I can get from here. Alpha is A over R. Let me do that replacement and I get uh, A over R is equal to R times the friction force divided by rotational inertia. Uh, let me solve this for um, Let's see. Let me solve this for friction. That way I can eliminate friction from this uh, uh, first equation. So, uh, so the friction force that's required so that we can have sufficient angular acceleration is, just doing this in my head, uh, I times A divided by R squared. Let me plug that in. Then what I get is... Um, m a is equal to m g sine theta minus all of that i over r squared times a let me collect uh, the like terms then i get i'm gonna move this term over to left hand side and then factor out a when i do that i get m plus i over r squared times a is equal to mg sine theta. I think this is as far as I can get, well, maybe one more step, but kind of close to as far as I can get without actually having specific expression for i. So let's uh, um, work out two scenarios. With one with expression for i, it, uh, rotational inertia of a disk is equal to um, one half m r squared and then after that's done, I'll do the second scenario. Rotational inertia of the ring is equal to lowercase m r squared. So with this first scenario, we have m plus uh, 1 over r squared times 1 over 2 m r squared. And you're going to continue to see this beautiful cancellation of r. Radius of the thing doesn't matter. Uh, times acceleration is equal to mg sine theta. Masses cancel out, great. Um, so this uh, parenthesis quantity is 1 plus 1 half, or you know, 1.5. That. So in this analysis, the effect of the thing, the, the thing rotating is, the effective mass of the uh, object is higher. Instead of having just 1, it's 1.5. So when you solve for acceleration, it's a g sine theta. Oops. Uh, okay. And when you solve for acceleration, it's a g sine theta divided by that. Let me uh, divide by 1.5. So that's the case for a disk. And when you do the exact same calculation for ring, then it's going to be m plus 1 over r squared, and now the rotational inertia, m r squared times a is equal to mg sine theta. Again, beautiful uh, cancellation of r squared. Um, 
another beautiful cancellation of m and so we have 1 plus 1 so this factor here becomes 2 so when you solve for acceleration acceleration for the ring is g sine theta over 2 so acceleration of the ring is lower than acceleration of the disk and i think that actually answers the question the question was asking uh, uh, which object undergoes greater acceleration the disk why because of the calculation how does this relate the one with the greater acceleration will reach the bottom faster and if you want the actual time you can go back and this time i think this set of equations will actually be shorter way so you can go through this and calculate the time and the answer you get should uh, agree with this and um yeah and <laughs> this has been about 40 minutes. So uh, I told you there's, at the beginning of this, I told you there's a third way. And I don't think uh, that we have time to actually do that third way. I'll just describe the third way. The third way to do this calculation, and actually maybe even a fourth way, is to um, use conservation of energy. And instead of breaking it up in this way, you know, in terms of translational kinetic energy, and rotational kinetic energy. If you realize that for any ro rolling object, this point is uh, stationary, you can actually treat this entirely as a pure rotation. And instead of having translational and rotational, you can just uh, have rotational kinetic energy and calculate that way. When you do it that way, the one thing you have to be careful, take care, is that you need to use the correct rotational inertia. So all the rotational inertia formulas I've been using was uh, rotational inertia about the center of mass. And once you are using this point as your center of rotation, then uh, you need to make sure use uh, rotational inertia about actual axis. And in order to find that formula, you can use... Uh, use uh, parallel axis theorem. Parallel axis theorem relates the rotational inertia about an axis going through the center of mass of the object with another axis that's a parallel to it. So you need to first to derive the correct rotational inertia and then um, and then go from there. So, uh, so that's uh, the secret third way. And that secret third way actually corresponds to the way a lot of people would have been approaching this, you know, make this rotation about this point, not rotation about the center of mass. So that uh, secret third way is the one that actually corresponds to analyzing this as kind of pure rotation about this point. So, so yeah, that's uh, this question. I've wanted to do this for a while and I haven't done it in the past on recording, so this is it. Uh, let me know of any questions.